So what is the deal with the Alberti bass? What is it? How does it work? And why is it everywhere in certain styles of music? First of all, the Alberti bass is a broken chord in this pattern. Typically, it's a three-note chord played low, high, middle, high uh, in a, in a four-note group. And it can be eighth notes, it can be sixteenth notes, the rhythmic speed doesn't really matter. Very, very often we see it as sixteenth notes. So really it's just a triad or some other chord broken up and played in this particular pattern, not this pattern and not any other pattern, but this specific one. And we'll talk about why. But first of all, who was Alberti? The, the bass itself is named after this guy, Domenico Alberti, who lived from 1710 to 1746. And indeed, his music includes a lot of this pattern. He certainly did not invent it. It's everywhere. And, and why people name it after him, I have not been able to find out. I don't know who just decided to call it that because there's a thousand other people who were using it at the same time. So he just got lucky, got something named after him. He did write a fair amount of keyboard music, but he was actually a singer uh, and wrote operas, which are apparently completely forgotten. It appears that nobody plays them today, as far as I've been able to figure out. Uh, but some of his keyboard music is still around when people on rare occasions think about it. He's not all that well known. So, let's hear what an Alberti sounds like. Simple enough. You've heard it probably all your life. Now, how did this pattern come to be so common in keyboard music? And I think the answer lies in thinking through the daily work of a composer at that time. So this could be Domenico uh, Alberti, this could be Mozart, Haydn, uh, really anybody from, from that era, what are they spending most of their time doing? If they write some keyboard, and they write some church music, and they write some opera, and they write some symphony, and some of this and some of that, what they spend a great deal of their time doing is writing string parts. One, because for every measure of piano music, there's only a bass and a treble staff, but for every measure of strings, there are typically five staves. First, second violins, violas, cellos, bass. Uh, so there's two and a half times as much notes to write for the same duration of music. Also, the strings dominate in most orchestral music. In concertos, in symphonies, in operas, the strings are doing most of the heavy lifting. The winds and brass and percussion come in, you know, for color and emphasis, but it's the strings that really put in the mileage. So if you actually took a day in the life of one of these composers, a lot of their time is just spent getting string notation on paper. And, and I learned this when uh, I wrote a few things for orchestra a number of years ago, just how much time you spend on that project in comparison with writing just for piano. And in particular, you're, you're very concerned with the textures. What is each level of the strings doing? So, um, what we see here is a picture from the Mozart C major concerto, K467, just a kind of typical string passage, where the upper strings have faster note values, those busy sixteenths, and the lower have uh, slower note values that are more pulsing on the beat. So between the two, we get something like this. Busy, fast, sixteenth notes up here, and uh, and then down in the bass, you know, maybe something a little bit slower. Maybe quarter notes or something like that. And that taken all together forms the accompaniment texture and maybe the uh, melody is somewhere else, maybe it's in the winds or whatever. But this is kind of a generic accompaniment texture. So, when you go from writing all this orchestral music to writing keyboard music, they didn't really switch their mindset that much. Taking, you know, I'm thinking of Mozart, Haydn, uh, Beethoven to some extent, although his piano music starts to become quite unique. Um, uh, but but to composers of the early classical era, 
the the way they wrote for piano is not very different from the way they wrote for orchestra. It's just a kind of shorthand version, a kind of condensed version of the same kind of music. It's the same kinds of themes, it's the same formal structures, it's the same chord progressions, but you have to translate the textures of the orchestra to the keyboard. So if you take this busier upper accompaniment and pulsing lower accompaniment, and you have to fit it all into the left hand, the Alberti bass is the natural way to do that because you get the bass, the lowest note is on the strongest beat, so you get that nice pulsing to kind of lock the music into its groove. But then you're also able to keep a moving texture of busy 16th notes going, so, so you have this constant rhythmic flowing texture and you're covering the bass and the accompanimental notes, the inner voices, all in one left hand, leaving the right hand free to play melody. So that's the essential reason why Alberti bass shows up. It allows you to condense an entire accompaniment pattern in the strings into the left hand. There are further advantages. Uh, first of all, we have to recognize that all styles of music have generic accompaniments. Generic doesn't mean bad. Generic actually means it's so good that everybody knows it works and everybody wants to use it. So for example, in uh, a jazz, small jazz ensemble, a combo, you have a rhythm section, which is typically at least bass and drums, the piano, of course, maybe guitar, um, and uh, that, that typically will do it. And the bass is going to walk on the beat. It's walking quarter notes, and then the um, piano and other instruments, accompanying instruments, are playing harmonic stuff, often in an interesting syncopated rhythm that fits with the bass. Doesn't doesn't lock in together one to one. It it differs from the bass, so they sound interesting together. So this is just a generic jazz accompaniment, and we all know when we hear it, like oh yeah, that's that's a jazz background. Maybe there's a saxophone solo that goes over top of it. Okay. So this is just a generic orchestral accompaniment that made its way to the piano. Other ones, um, a, a really famous one for strings is just each member of the string section just plays eighth notes. Um, and those are going to be what's called detaché, which is where there's no bowing written on it. It just the bow goes back and forth. So, you know, you might have cellos down here doing this. You could have basses an octave above that. You could have something else uh, playing other members of the chord up here. And the whole thing is just going along in this chuk 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 chuk. We do see that in the piano, but it's a little chunky sounding on the piano. And so often, even that kind of thing will be translated into a slightly more transparent texture like an Alberti or something else. So generic accompaniments is really where all of this comes from. And they're generic because they work. They're practical. Okay, another aspect of this is that um, it's it compensates for the limited sustain of the early pianos, the forte pianos. Uh, you know, they spent 150 years or so coming up with beefier and beefier pianos where when you play a note, It rings quite a while. Uh, this is a six and a half foot piano. Uh, the bigger you go, the longer they ring, the more powerful they are. And as you move into the 19th century with these pianos being developed, you have composers taking advantage of the sustain. Think Brahms, for example. Okay. Later on, even more sustained, think Debussy. But in the time of Mozart, Haydn, you really couldn't count on a piano to, to sustain a long time. And so the reiteration of the 16th notes, plucking them over and over again so you keep hearing them anew, compensates for the fact that they're all dying out. So it's closer to a um, sustained kind of accompaniment. And interestingly, you know, if you look at the, um, 
the slow movements of Mozart in the piano literature, often the accompaniment is something repeated, like an Alberti or uh, this kind of thing. Right? It's something where it keeps getting struck over again, as opposed to one long chord that just rings, which we would see in Brahms, for example. So it's compensating for the lack of sustain on those early keyboard instruments. And finally, we should mention briefly the technical aspects of playing the Albertis. Because the Alberti is different notes of the hand played at different times, many pianists are tempted to freeze the hand in place and activate each finger in isolation. And they find Albertis to be extremely tiring when they play the, them in isolation. But actually, the Alberti gives rise to a rotational motion. The whole forearm tilts toward each note as it's played, rather than the fingers moving alone. And it's very important to understand this and to practice this when you encounter Albertis. They're quite easy with a proper technique, and they're very difficult with an isolated technique. So I do urge everyone to think carefully about the technical aspects of Albertis. So next time you're playing and practicing and you see an Alberti, think of what kind of orchestral texture the composer had in mind and how that texture has been made into a shorthand for your instrument.